So first off, my apologies for not doing the Raw review immediately after Raw Monday night, uh, but after staying up and watching that horrendous Battleground show, reviewing it, waiting for it to upload, I was going out about three hours of sleep. I made it through as much of Raw as possible, and frankly, uh, once I saw those bald jobbers at the club, it was nighty night time, and I'm sure it was the case for others, not just me. But anyways... Uh, on to more important things. Make sure you visit the OTRS Central store at Pro Wrestling Tees and hashtag buy a shirt. Find that subscribe button. Click it. It's about hashtag subscribe or die. Click the bell. What the hell? Let's make wrestling fun again. Now, on to this week's Raw. It was better than Battleground, which isn't saying a whole lot. But the thing is, is I can get Raw as part of my regular cable package. I have to pay WWE Network subscription price of $9.99 each month to get Battleground. Yet again, the TV show was better than the pay-per-view. I'm just saying, why would you watch the pay-per-view? Especially when you look at this opening segment. You know, predictable could be bad, and usually is, but every once in a while, predictable is okay. Because you get to a point in a situation where you really have no alternative and no choice. And even though people can see it coming, that that's okay. If it's well done, that's what matters the most. And what you're doing here with this opening segment Kurt Angle trying to determine who's going to face Brock Lesnar at SummerSlam. You've got Samoa Joe out there, Roman Reigns out there, Braun Strowman out there. And don't throw through all this rigmarole and all this other bullshit. Just dive right in. It's clearly the monster in the room. Everybody knows. Fatal 4-Way, SummerSlam, these three guys and Brock. Would have been nice if Brock was actually there, but maybe he'll be there next week on Raw. Eminently more interesting than anything that happened on Battleground. And, you know, the one thing I will say about Raw right now that has my interest at least a little bit is you have some big, badass motherfuckers vying for the world title. It actually feels like the world title means a little something. Like, these are guys I can take seriously. These are guys that I can take legit. So I really, truly appreciate that. Whereas SmackDown has a fucking Jinder Mahal as a world champion and frickin', of course, Cena breathing down the neck of title reign number 17... LOL, Cena wins, hashtag breakfast club rules, bitches. You've got these big badass motherfuckers trying to vie for the top spot. And even though I'm usually not a fan of triple threats and fatal four ways, main eventing big four pay-per-views of WWE, I will make an exception to the rule in this particular case. Great opening segment. Again, maybe because of the fact it went up against Battleground from the night before, it was so much better. <laughs> so, so much better. And then we dive right into the no disqualification match between Elias Sampson and Finn Balor. I'm like, oh, okay, I got this segment where these guys are talking shit and kicking ass and everything else. Now we go to Elias Sampson, who I care about, and of course, Finny the Twink, who I do not. And let's be honest, even though this match was honestly not that bad, uh, you knew how this was going to end. And this is an example of predictable being bad. Because I have absolutely zero interest in Bray Wyatt versus Finn Balor. And you shouldn't have any interest in it either. At this point in time, instead of building up to a match between these two at SummerSlam, I literally would like to see a contest between them uh, with their entrances. Do the biggest and baddest best entrance you possibly can. And let the best man win. I don't need to see these guys in a long feud. I don't need to see them wrestle. That's for goddamn sure. Just have... An entrance contest at SummerSlam, and we'll call it a fucking day. Uh, speaking of calling it a fucking day, enough is enough with having Enzo wrestle Big Cass. You already did that once at pay-per-view, and again, why watch the pay-per-view when you just get the crap again, in this case, a couple of weeks later on TV? Why wouldn't you just wait and be patient and eventually get it on TV anyways? But what was puzzling to me is, why would you just basically repeat the Great Balls of Fire match again. Why not in this case have Big Cass get pissed off that he's having to wrestle Enzo again and beat the shit out of him so badly that the referee has to stop the thing and eventually Cass doesn't obey the referee's commands and Cass gets disqualified instead of what doing what they did. And, you know, I understand Big Show's the next logical opponent and Big Show, in theory, is a stepping stone type of guy to try to establish a big ass, the Casshole. Lots of uh, ass-related names for Cass. Um, but the way they do this, they're making Big Show look really pathetic. And while people like Grant and I understand don't care much about Big Show, uh, they need to have Big Show get one over on him at some point in time. And in general, Cass is just a weird talent to figure out right now. 
Like, you know he's seven foot, but he doesn't feel like a giant. You know he's a big guy, but he's got an awful lot of pudge there. Test he's not. He may be able to talk a little bit, but is he only able to talk because he's going toe-to-toe on the mic with Enzo and Enzo's bringing it out of him? Um, Is he really that good in the ring? He's just, you look at him and you think in theory, maybe he should be a big deal. But then you look at him at times and you wonder if he's just nothing more than a seven foot jobber. I'm just saying, weird talent to figure out. Who's not a weird talent to figure out is Emma. She deserves her burial. She deserved everything she fucking gets. You stupid bitch. Stop bitching about WWE trying to get you to do things that branch outside of the freaking ring. You want to sit there and complain and cry and bitch and moan about opportunities you were given an opportunity and you wanted to sandbag it as far as i'm concerned this company should continue to bury you until you are fucking released because they don't fucking need you they have better talent that they could bring in from elsewhere nxt you're on the independent scene somebody else would take that opportunity and get themselves over of course emma no matter what they do won't be able to get over and screw you if you're going to sit there and try to defend emma Ooh, it's okay, it's your not everybody needs to wrestle the dumb bitch needs to get it through her skull. So clearly WWE was sending a message here by having Nia Jax just squash the shit out of her. And I loved every minute of it. I loved every minute of it. But what I don't understand is why Nia can't get a title run. Or at least a title shot at SummerSlam. You know, the brand split really exposes the lack of depth on the roster for the women. Because you only have, what, probably six women per show. So you get really repetitive in the things that you do. Um, why not have Nia do something better than this? But for one night, God, I enjoyed the hell out of watching her squash the shit out of Emma. Like, literally, splash squash the shit out that bitch. Uh, this whole thing with Tazawa, Neville, Davari, it's like, oh, it's the wrong Davari. Uh, not the one that I would care about. It's a shame Neville has to waste his time in the stupid division, but at least the ring crew doesn't have to waste their time on the purple ropes anymore. You're build, are you building up to a triple threat for 205 Live? Are we really building up to a triple threat between these three guys at SummerSlam? Like, why the fuck would anybody care about this Davari kid at this point? And I'm just saying. Uh, Bailey Sasha Banks. Now, surely this is the match that a lot of people enjoyed because they're nerds. Fuck this match and these two broads getting never-ending uh, title shots and matches for title opportunities. Again, the brand split exposes the lack of depth on the women's roster, and I'm tired of seeing these two broads get a title shot. And what is it about these weird fucking screwy-ass types of finishes where you had the shit with AJ and Kevin Owens at Battleground, was that intentional or not? Now you come here, and if my eyes served me correctly, one of Sasha Banks' shoulders was up when the pinfall happened for when Bayley won. It's like, what the fuck? And now all of a sudden people are going to like Bayley again? Fuck that shit, too. Go hug yourselves in the damn quarter and cry yourselves into your freaking chocolate pudding. I don't care. Nia Jax should have the title shot at SummerSlam, not these two. Why? If for any other reason than the fact that there is some story between her and Alexa Bliss, and she's also not Sasha Banks or fucking Bayley. These girls have had enough title shots. How many more title shots are they going to get in 2017? And and just, that's it. I mean, I'm sure people are going to... Praise this match to kingdom fucking come. I had no interest in this match whatsoever. And neither should you have. Uh, What else I didn't have interest in? Jason Jordan's extended interview. Who signed off on this long-ass, touchy-feely lifetime crap? If you want to talk about the relationship between Jason Jordan and Kurt Angle, we need weeks of vignettes. Them drinking milk together. Playing catch, playing basketball, golfing, uh, whistling at chicks. All these different things that fathers and sons would do together, Jason Jordan and Kurt Angle should be doing. Jason Jordan should not be given several minutes of interview time that's just kind of awkward and you're just twiddling your thumbs and be like, is this guy going to stop talking now? Kind of like some of you when you watch one of my videos. But I will say this about Jason Jordan. This is an opportunity. How good of an opportunity remains to be seen. But he has a multi-million dollar look. I mean, he looks the part of a franchise player. Um, he's got some ring talent. Um, personality, eh, maybe there's something there, maybe there's not. Only time will tell. 
but he needs a hook. He needs some type of gimmick, some type of shtick. And maybe that comes down the road. Um, if you find out all along this was just some big ruse by Triple H trying to mind fuck him and Jason Jordan turns heel and aligns with God, oh, glory be. Um, but you could see it with him and Kurt Hawkins. You know, Jordan's got potential. There is potential there. Now, of course, a lot of people are just going to focus on Chad Gable and it, it, it is what it is. Let him be on that crappy shit show that's SmackDown. Give me Jason Jordan and let me be excited about the potential for this kid. I like the revival. Um, let me say this. I appreciate kind of their no-nonsense approach, no flips, just fist. You know I'm down with that. Um, I don't know if long-term Vince is going to get them. I don't know if Vince is going to like them. But for now, I feel like they're being presented pretty well. I do wish the revival and the Hardys hadn't wrestled already. This feels like something that if you're trying to go old school versus new school, should have waited for a big show like, oh, I don't know, maybe fucking SummerSlam, instead of just randomly thrown in there last week on Raw. And where are they going in terms of the tag team picture here? Because you have Sheamus and Cesaro watching this match, which uh, when I went back and watched was actually pretty solid. I'll say that. Um, but... Are we doing Revival and Hardys and we don't give a shit about the tag champs? Is it going to be a triple threat? Is it going to be a fatal four-way? Is it going to be an elimination uh, tag team title match at SummerSlam? I don't, I'm kind of confused about where they're going at this point. Other than the Hardys and the Revival are going to do something. But again, I wish they wouldn't have had these guys touch already in terms of actually wrestling a match. Um, two guys that I wish would just go away are Dean Ambrose and Seth Rollins. And my God, this main event, I won't say it's shitty. I just think it's stupid. It's stupid to think that you would want to put Dean Ambrose and Seth Rollins in the main event of your fra flagship brand in 2017, although you figure by then enough people have probably tuned out that it doesn't freaking matter, and they're probably correct. But Dean Ambrose and Seth Rollins absolutely stink in their current roles, Ambrose doesn't give a fuck. Seth Rollins, I don't know what the hell his deal is. Just inherently um, uninteresting, period. I don't care what shit you want to talk about, this or that. It, they're, they're just dumb. And what's really dumb is you have a two-on-three handicap match with your Intercontinental Champion. What are we building to? A fucking th another triple threat title match at SummerSlam? Is almost every single match on this goddamn card going to be a triple threat or a fatal four-way or some horse shit like that? But then you have Ambrose and Rollins go over. Why are we having the baby faces go over the heels when the heels have the man advantage? Why bother? Why follow anything pertaining to the story? Why even continue the story at that point in time? Because you have now undercut the heels uh, heat. You've gotten the baby faces no more over. It's just this 50-50 dumb shit, dipshit booking that this company's been notorious for in recent years and I don't fucking get. And that was the end of the show. And it was lame. It was a fucking lame thing. So summarizing this week's Raw, it opened up really strongly with that opening segment. And there were still elements within the first hour to hour and a half that were at least passable if not all right. Like I said, I appreciated the hell out of Nia Jack squashing the shit out of that dumb bitch, Emma. You want your opportunity? Here you go. This fat bitch is going to just plow on you. There you go. But once we especially got to Bailey and Sasha Banks, I found myself giving less and less of a fuck. Uh, Jason Jordan, like I said, once you got past the freaking never-ending interview, you could see there's some potential there. Um, but... If you were going to ask me, would I have rather paid for this show or Battleground? Uh, it's not even close. <laughs> the answer is clearly obvious, which, which was a good thing for Raw because it didn't leave me a whole lot to rant and rave about this week, even though I critiqued some things because it was so much more imminently uh, watchable than anything on Battleground Sunday night. So that's it. I'm the Schleg Daddy, and this is OTRS Central. Make sure you tune in for some other videos throughout the week. Buy a shirt, damn it. Subscribe or die. And remember, this is not the wrestling show you want, just the wrestling show you need. Goodbye, everybody.